Edfu Foundation Incorporated utilizes science and the teachings of our ancestors to improve humanity. We want to reunite and uplift our family throughout the planet. Our message or theme for 2021 is Original People United. We work hand in hand with our sister organization, the Conservancy Corp, investing in the future of humanity through our programs and advocacy. We seek to move our civilization from its current state to that of a type one civilization on the Carter Jeff civilization scale and beyond in a spiritually holistic way. We stand by the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Durban Declaration and Program of Action and support United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and Environment Justice. Support Apple Foundation by checking out our page and subscribing. Here comes Mr. Cole right here. All right, and here's our first guest. No doubt, no doubt. Promote to panelists. What's up, David? David, how you doing? I'm doing hey. well. I'm doing well. Yo, Moo, can we get the music down just a little bit? I got it. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. That's perfect. Ooh, you just had Thanks a power for... outage, man. That's crazy. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you coming from, David? I'm on the West Coast. I'm up in Portland. Oh, okay. Damn. Yeah. Half the weather. Yeah, it's, it's like it was beautiful yesterday and today it's raining and it's a storm and whatnot. So okay. if something happens, it's the power. So, OK, OK, I got you. I got you. Yeah, we uh we had like an earthquake last week while I was on one of these and <laughs> it knocked out the Internet. Yeah. Um, For a quick minute, uh, which was it was like really weird. It was like a really quick earthquake and then all of a sudden the Internet wasn't working, but it came back on like 10 minutes later. Yeah, well, thank, thankfully there's no earthquakes today, or well, hasn't been <laughs> yet, because I can't handle those, man. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, really? Yes, 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 scary, man. Mm -hmm. It's an earthquake, yeah. man. Yeah. Really? Like, yeah. you just, like, you have earthquake specialist. Really? Listen, so I, I live... The, the, the first, never bothered me. <laughs> the first earthquake, I lived in Hawaii, and then I lived on a big island in Hawaii. And uh, in Hawaii, uh, that island does get earthquakes, right? Uh -huh. Um i never felt an earthquake until i went to japan and i was sitting on the bed in the hotel and i was like is this a vibrating bed like for like for like 20 seconds i'm like is this a vibrating bed? what's going on like and then they're like no it's an earthquake i'm like oh god damn okay <laughs> that's what earthquake feels like man, um, I, felt, so <laughs> I, I felt one in chicago and i couldn't believe it man. I, I, it was the middle of the night and it was like the biggest train i ever heard in my life was passing by outside and there wasn't no trains around. So I was like, what the hell? You know what I mean? <laughs> Just shaking it, riding it out. That's scary, man. I, I can't yeah. imagine anything more scarier than that. Cause you don't really have no control. You just, you might go right that's through true. the earth. That's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? For real. Yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess that's true. That is true. That is true. Uh, anything um, else you can run. You can't run from an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you got some type of device to let you levitate or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, definitely. You're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, I don't know. I've had a, I've experienced like three here. They've never been uh, more than a minute or so, but, uh, like, yeah, it doesn't, for some reason, maybe I just don't think about it that way, but it doesn't. You just a positive brother. You just yeah, a that's super it. Yeah, I was gonna say. You got, you, got the, you got the Lord in your heart. You is not yeah. Cause Jesus I would like to think so. Jesus is always at the wheel. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> you, you, you must be the sort of cat who like, when you order a steak, you, you order it medium rare. See, and I'm just kind of always ordering it well done because I'm worried <laughs> I'm going to get some food poisoning. Nice. And yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's just me. Always that's, looking over my that's shoulder. Beautiful. Yeah. That, that's beautiful. That's beautiful, Sheldon. And you remember the uh, the movie, uh, The Outsiders? I think it was Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you trying to call me Pony Boy? <laughs> he said, stay golden. Stay golden. <laughs> Whatever you do, Sheldon, stay golden. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt no doubt hey so we have uh lawana dr lawana richmond on with us and we have professor david f walker with us and i just want to thank you for being here 
on Afronauts as we relaunch uh, a new version of Afronauts before we were on Blog Talk Radio. Um, you know, with COVID and everything, we we kind of switched it up. It showed us we could do something a little different. So we are now doing like a vlog. We'll have an audio version available. But what we're going to do is we're going to um, have our vlog podcast like this, and then uh, we'll edit it, and then we'll release it over um, like Facebook Live and YouTube so that we can any so don't worry about making any mistakes or you know what i mean <laughs> or like you know what i mean like any mess right, ups it's, anything it's like... gonna be edited it's gonna be edited, <laughs> so you know feel free relax you know what I mean? yes yes so when y'all came in talking about when i came in y'all was talking about earthquakes mm -hmm. yes and um i grew up here in san diego and i can say that um earthquakes made me stop getting turned <laughs> i i was coming home from tj one morning and I was walking up the stairs to my apartment and a tremor started. And so, you know how when we feel like we're in danger, we start making promises to God and you know, all the things. And so, yeah. yes. that, that was the end of my um, TJ shenanigans. Yeah, look, that earthquake ain't nothing nice. I don't care if nobody say that. That's, that's the only thing that, that scares me about the West Coast like that. It's like the vote is right there. It's going to happen. It ain't yeah. if it's gonna happen, it's going it's to happen yeah. at some point. You know what I mean? It, it, uh, the, yeah, the, but the it earth, don't have earth. to happen no time soon. Man. I'm not yeah, trying to rush every, it. But every, everybody thinking like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, but thanks to <laughs> fracking, you can have an earthquake in Ohio. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah it's true. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So now you just got me. I'm I'm sitting here all terrified, looking. <laughs> <around me. laughs> I done messed up his whole existence. He moving yeah, tomorrow. He, he got the, he already in the day of Google and shit. I, I don't I don't know if it's all the caffeine I've had this morning or if the ground is actually shaking. So but yeah. So uh yeah, I'm glad that you were able both to able to join me and you know I gotta give that like that quick spiel about your 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 itinerary. I'm sorry, your resume, because it's is illustrious on both sides. And so, you know, David Walker is an award-winning comic book writer, filmmaker, journalist, and educator. Walker is best known for his works, his work in comics, including Shaft, A Complicated Man, winner of the 2015 Glyph Award for Story of the Year and its sequel, Shaft, Imitation of Life. Uh, his work for Marvel Comics includes Luke Cage, Occupy Avengers, uh, Power Man and Iron Fist, Nighthawk, Fury, and Deadpool, as well as some others. I know there's uh, this is a little older, so I know you had some newer ones in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's also worked for DC Comics, Cyborg, Planet of the Apes, and IDW Monkey Brain. He's a creator of Prose YA series, The Adventures of Darius Logan, and author of the novel Shaft's Revenge, the first new novel starring the iconic black detective in more than 40 years. So David is here and he's gonna talk to us about his graphic novels. Uh, last time it was Frederick Douglass, but now it's the Black Panther Party. And um, and I gotta tell you, I'm a huge fan of the Black Panther Party. I grew up with them as like, you know, messianic figures in my household. Like it was the Black Panther Party, Dr. King and John F. Kennedy, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, so I grew up with them as like, I have people in my family that were Black Panthers. My mom has a famous picture that she drew of Bobby Seale when he was gagged and bound in court. Um, I, I, had, um, I was honored to meet uh, Bobby Seale uh, a few years ago uh, with uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. And so that was a great pleasure of mine. And uh, so David, I'm, uh, I thank you for one for doing it. I don't think there's enough exposure about the Black Panther Party. I think they get a bad rap. Um, so what kind of brought you into um, writing these graphic novels, first of all, <laughs> that talk about our history? And then secondly, uh, what, what, what makes you choose like Frederick Douglass and then the Black Panther Party? Well, you know, it's um, I've always been I, well, I've been writing comics for a very long time. And, and I thought just a tiny little bit about doing some nonfiction stuff. And specifically, I, I wanted to do something about uh, Fred Hampton who was the Illinois Black Panther Party chairman and, and was uh, murdered by the Chicago Police Department. And that was something that's been in, in my mind for a long time, but you know, it, it, it was almost like a bucket list sort of thing that I wanted to work on. And, and then I got uh, an email one day, this is about three, four years ago from an editor at 10 Speed Press. And, and he basically said, hey, you know, I'm a fan of your work 
and have you ever thought about doing nonfiction? We're thinking about doing a book about the life of Frederick Douglass. And, and I was like, well, yeah, I thought a little bit about doing nonfiction, but never anything about the life of Frederick Douglass. But um, I, I live by the mantra that the opportunity doesn't necessarily knock on your door. Sometimes it will plug your toilet and you just got to, you know, do what you got to do to get a hold of that opportunity. So, um, so I said yes to Frederick Douglass because I wanted the experience and, and to see if I liked doing um, nonfiction. And, and I, it, was, it was a real difficult job, but I, I got a lot out of it. And, and I had mentioned to that editor at the time, I said, you, I, I mentioned how I always wanted to do something about Fred Hampton. And so when I was done with Frederick Douglass, he, he brought up the Black Panther Party. And he said, you know, um, the Fred Hampton story is really compelling, but, you know, not everybody knows enough about the Black Panthers. And, and really to make that story, make, make Fred Hampton's story um, something people can really understand and empathize with, you, I think you need to do the history of the Panthers. And, and I wasn't about to say, well, no, I'm not going to do the history of the Panthers because I just want to do this one thing. You know, <laughs> I took it as a challenge and was like, okay, let's, let's do this. Um, because, you know, sometimes when, when, when we're interested in something, whether it's, it's historical or fiction, we, we understand it in a way that a lot of other people don't. And we take for granted that other people are going to understand it, right? And, and so I saw that challenge with the Panthers. And, um, and so that, that, that was how that one came to be. And it was, it was while doing the Panther book that I really began to realize that, you know, um, it was like Luana was talking about when she was, you know, coming up the stairs during that earthquake, you know, it was like, I realized, oh, wait a sec, you know, this really is a calling for me. This is, this is more than, you know, I, I wanted to test it out and see how I felt about it. Um, but, but it was, it really turned out to be something that, um, that I feel like this is where I need to be taking my, my career and my life is, is in this, um, this area of, of educating, in a way that I, I want to be careful how I say this. I think that a lot of the books out there, both about the Panthers, about Frederick Douglass, about anything that you can think about that has to deal with history and especially black history. man, a lot of them books are just too difficult to read, you know, and they are, they're full of, I'm a college professor. And if, if there's a word that I have to go to, to look it up in the dictionary to know what it means, then we got a problem. Right. And so, I, part of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make our history accessible, especially to young people who, you know, you pick up a book that's like 800 pages and there ain't no pictures in it. Even I don't want to read it, you know, so <laughs> I, I, I really feel like we've, we've, um, we've allowed education in a lot of ways to become something that is, is it's not that it's inaccessible, it's not that it's appealing, right, you know, and, and the thing is, is we should... I think our responsibility is to educate people. We need to meet them somewhere along the way. And, and as someone who grew up reading graphic novels and reading, well, they were comic books when I was a kid, they didn't even call them graphic novels. You know, that was like, I mean, my introduction to, to a lot of things. I used to read Classics Illustrated, you know, the first time I ever read Mark Twain or Charles Dickens was, was the comic book version and there ain't nothing wrong with that. So. Um, yeah, that's a long, I'm sorry, that's a long ass answer too. <laughs> no, no, I love it. That's, that, that's great. No, that's great. And I think you said, uh... that was beautiful, man. That, that Thank really you. was beautiful because I've always, I've always thought that, you know, you know, it's, you could be very smart and very articulate and spit a lot of words, but if the people that you're talking to not understanding what you're saying, how smart is that? I mean, yep. what, what, what have you actually accomplished? You know, I would rather have somebody break it down to where you can understand it, you know what I mean? So you know that that knowledge is being transferred other than just trying to get up there and show off your, your vocabulary. Yeah, you know yeah, yeah no, the, I agree 100%. And, and that's, you know, I, I was fortunate in that, you know, I, I come from a family, my grandparents are from the deep, uh, deep South Virginia, right, right on the border of North Carolina. And so um, I have a lot of people in my family who, who have, like the real heavy Southern drawl and accent, you know, and they finna to go to the stove and, and things like that. And, and I know from growing up that there's a way of talking and a way of sounding 
that a lot of people will dismiss as not being intelligent, right? And and that's bullshit because I was raised by some of the smartest people, <laughs> you know, you could ever hope to meet, except sometimes it was difficult to understand what they were saying, you know, talk real fast and the big ideas and have blah, blah, blah. And and so to me, it's like you can't ever dismiss somebody just because of either the way they sound or sometimes a choice of words that they use. And and if that person does have trouble understanding stuff or being understood, how do you meet them halfway, you know? No, no, I agree. And I want to bring in Luana. Uh, we have Dr. Luana Richmond with us as well. She's an accomplished woman in multiple fields. Uh, most recently, she ran for a San Diego school board. Um, she did not win, but she got over 175,000 votes. And she was elected as the San Diego woman's Democratic president. And she's also uh, one of the founders of the Afrofuturism Lounge and the Dream Tank. And she's going to talk to us about that a little later, but she's also an educator. And so, David, you said something really profound, as you said, you know, when you're educating people, you want to kind of meet them where they are so that you can get that point across. And I think that is a, one of the failures in the current educational system. And I just want to get Dr. Luana Richmond's opinion on that. So, so thank you for that. Um, I want to start by saying that when I ran, I ran on a platform that included um, decolonization of education as a priority. Um, it may have had something to do with the outcome. Um, but uh, what David said about um, writing and how things are written in a way where people are trying to impress you with how many um, big words they know, academic writing, unfortunately, um, I remember when I was working on my dissertation, I started off saying things very plainly and through the different edits and rewrites and the requirements that I use language in a, and write in a specific tone, academic, language, academic writing is almost engineered or designed to be unaccessible. And so something that is a really simple point because of the rigmarole and the hoops you have to jump through in order for it to be considered acceptable in the academy make it useless in the public realm. And then the other part, you know, when uh, David was talking about um, vernacular, so my folks said fixing to. <laughs> but the thing we have to remember is that many of us have ancestors who were, um, it was illegal for them to learn how to read in this country. So we adapted. It, it, the, the brilliance and the genius that came, it, you know, they're, they, they're still uncovering things that we um, were at the root of, like, like inoculations right. in this country. Right. So um, I think education is really important. And I think um, comics are a great literacy tool. And I think it's often overlooked because um, I don't know if you remember the movie with Steve Martin and Queen Latifah where the little boy couldn't read and she gave him comic books and porn and all of a sudden he became very literate. No, I don't remember that movie, but uh, that's, that's please funny. put the name of that in the chat for us yeah, so we yeah, can yeah, check I, it out I, later. Uh, <laughs> it's genius, but, but, but diabolical at the same time. <laughs> what have you just created? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, no, but that, I mean, that's an excellent point. I mean, we, and I think uh, it, it's incumbent upon us as people who want to, you know, and I say, I say it as us because it's quite clear in the work that you do, David, and that you do, uh, Luana, that you want to help the community. And that us here at Afronauts and Ed Food, that's what we want to do. That's why one of the reasons we created the show. We want to help our community move forward, right? And so it's incumbent upon those who want to help their community to try and reach people where they are and not try and come in and tell them they need to come up to this standard necessarily. Not that they're at any less standard than anyone else. It's like David said, right? Uh, it's just people, you know, they just have different ways. Like, you know, Mugnito's in Chicago, I'm on the West Coast. Uh, Luana's in San Diego, David's in Portland. There's different ways that like we operate in those areas, right? And that's just a, a, an adaptive behavior that we hey, as black forget, people- Don't forget about uh, Poncho in the Bronx, man. Yeah, Paco in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. Paco, Paco Pete. Paco, Paco in the Bronx. Don't forget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's just different ways that we have uh, learned to adapt to uh, deal with the society that has, like you said, Luana, uh, colonized us. And to in order to decolonize that, you know, we have to work 
the methods that work best for us. So yeah, I, I definitely want to just appreciate y'all for being here and doing the work that you, you know, do. Lawana La- La- says so. Uh, Lawana is it Lawana? Lawana. Lawana. She says something very profound. You know that I didn't even think about. Uh, uh, you know, is how the, you know, the academic structure, you know, is built to keep it, you know, exclusive. You know, on purpose. You know, what I mean? you know that says a lot. But you know, and, and I think that goes back to my uh, evil capitalistic view of you know the U.S. and everybody trying to capitalize off something you know, and, and turning it into to evil at the end of the day. You know. What I mean? <laughs> I never thought about that. So yeah, thank you, Luana. Yeah. Which is why you're the anti-villain. <laughs> That's I am the villain. What you talking about? <laughs> in, in this in this realm, I'm the villain. This this the this is what you call that uh, the bizarre world world. <laughs> <laughs> the the well, heroes the heroes are the villains, and the villains are really the heroes. So well, listen, 2020. And the beginning of 21 was definitely bizarro world. So <laughs> you're fitting right in there, right in there. So I want to introduce Peter Paco Cole. Just call me Paco. All right. It was, I want to introduce Paco. Uh, he's new to our show, but he's going to be here every time we show up. And he's going to do a segment called What's Next with uh, Paco. So we're going to give him a couple of minutes. And then we're going to get back to the questions and uh, some music by Mugnito. So um here we go, Paco. What's next with Paco? So you're up. All right. Um, today on what's next. First of all, people need to have context in terms of what next is. It's a it's a weekly or bi-weekly, however, we're gonna record the show, look back on uh the months or the previous months' events, current events, uh at, or key moments as they pertain or or directly or indirectly impact indigenous culture and life. Um, one thing is, you know, when, when you're approaching something from a journalistic standpoint, you know what I mean? Uh, Sheldon told me I'm a citizen reporter. I'm not a journalist, you know what I mean? So- um, I didn't tell you you weren't a journalist. I, you, I just told you, if you don't want to use the word journalist, call yourself a citizen reporter. To me, if I call myself a journalist, and that opens me up to somebody to scrutinize, oh, you're not a real journalist. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm not, you know. But you know, I wanna, I wanna bring integrity to journalism because what we see on the news is actors, and just that's just my opinion. So I wanna approach it, you know. First of all, having respect for others, uh, I wanna give indigenous issues a voice. Um, so. I'm not really that good at it. So I prepared a statement. I wrote a statement. You know what I mean? So the first, the first topic I want to cover is the Capitol insurrection slash siege, or we'll just call them the infinite infamous events of January 6, 2021. Okay. Uh, my statement is as follows. Hope all is well. Like many of you, I was shocked and sickened by the act of domestic terrorism on our nation's capital. The breach of the US Capitol building, the evacuation of our democratically elected representatives and citizens doing their job, and the desecration of the halls and offices of our government is one of the darkest days in the history of our nation. It fills me with sadness as well as anger. Again, like many of you, we were also equally disturbed by the response of some or most law enforcement officers who apparently allowed the rioters, the Trump supporters to enter and leave the grounds with little or no resistance. The lives of countless black Americans have been lost for profoundly less threatening actions than we saw perpetuated on January 6. This response illustrates our country's deepest troubled past and our present. I didn't, I should have edited it, I'm sorry. <laughs> no one watching this act of domestic terrorism can avoid making parallels to the violent response of law enforcement to the nonviolent Black Lives Matters protests in the Capitol around the country during the protests sparked by the killing of George Floyd in 2020. It is undeniable that our country must reckon with its past and must work towards a greater 
equity and justice for all its citizens. And it's our responsibility to confront these equalities and have con conversations around the injustice that transpired on January 6th. So, um, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, you, you get to call yourself a journalist, man. Uh, don't, don't, none of the citizen reporter stuff. That's journalism. Just, I'll take it, I, brother David. I, I thank you. I, I appreciate that, and and I work, I worked on that. I'm not the greatest writer. I think I write like I talk. So sometimes it doesn't, you know what I mean? It doesn't translate. Like it sounds choppy when I'm reading it. But if I was talking it, you know, it makes in my mind it makes perfect sense. Um. While that is my politically correct statement, my thoughts are, you know, uh, from a- Yes, let's hear the non-politically correct version now. Paco from the Bronx. <laughs> How this directly affects the indigenous community, all right? The writing is on the wall, okay? And if I need to spell it out or, you know, that yesterday was like the, the nail, I mean, on January 6th, that was the nail in the coffin for me that says to me that there are two Americas, okay? There's the America for non-white people and there's, then there's the America for people that um, uh, are entitled and believe that they, uh, that was their building, that they were invited, you know what I mean, as if, Mr. Trump could give invitations. I don't think he's, I don't think that's, I think that's beyond his scope of authority to invite. <laughs> you know what he I mean? has to get an invitation. Yes. <laughs> None of these <laughs> calls were followed, not even police protocol, which we taxpayers spend billions of dollars in police training. So I think they were prepared and I think they made a choice. Their choice was clear. Um, I, I believe it's a it's a very heated topic. I've discussed it with several of my non indigenous friends, you know, um, and they seem to they seem to I almost I almost <laughs> been I almost <laughs> been by Drake. Yeah, I'm sorry, he said not nah, uh, nah, nah, indigenous against friends. Republican the the you know the whole political it was a political thing. In my opinion, it it absolutely was not political. It was all no, not at all motivated definitely okay that was white rage that's that's what happened in tulsa oklahoma that's what happened in rosewood florida that's what happened anytime you just go to uh the lynching museum or look at the lynching postcards that's what happens when people feel that their position of authority or like you said privilege or entitlement is threatened every time in america this happens again and again think any other named group so they're a, they're considered a named group what are they considered are they considered i, I just I, I don't know i've been looking it up and i'm trying they, they're not considered proud boys q and I. so what was that group called what what would well, you call other than white supremacists i'm well you just said it but it was a conglomeration of all these groups but it basically boils down to white nationalists i don't really like the term white supremacists because it it's I'm something glad. as though it's go ahead I'm glad we going down this path. Uh, you, you, you see, you see we, talk about, we talk about unity. We talk about unity now. You know what I mean? The first thing the Democrats said when they stepped up there after they were, we need to unify the nation. I'm like, okay, who are we unifying with? These people unified with all these other groups that were against everybody else in the United States of America. You know what I mean? So we supposed to, oh, you know what? We won. These people showed uh, up rage. They 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 trespass, breaking and entering, assault. I count I count several felonies. And they had guns, uh, weapons, bombs, and restraints. And five, yeah. and, oh, and let's not forget, five people died. Yes, so, yes, yes. And a, 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 and a six. Hold on, a six died as a result of suicide. So we don't know what trauma he suffered during those attacks that caused him to kill himself. And that's very important to know. Don't. I, so to me, uh, six people died as a result of those capital riots. You are correct. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and the tone that we have after it, you know, it's not outrage. You know, like, why is it not outrage on these people? You know, why are we not stomping them out? You know, like like they stomped out the Black Panthers when, you know, when they felt threatened, you know what I mean? Or, or, or something of that, you know, nature. It, it's, we got to unify.
You know, it's not stomp them out. It's not we put the foot on their neck. Well, and get the shit out so of to, to be fair, hey, 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 look, look, Civil War. You know, Civil War. We won the Civil War. Why did they not just go down there and stomp them out and and, and, and get rid of that right there? They didn't do it. And now look at us. Years later, we still, still dealing, dealing with, with the same shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so, so to be fair, to be fair. To be fair, excuse the, me. The, the Civil War, they did try to stop them out. They were they were voted. All white people in the South could not vote. That was the whole Reconstruction era. You actually had black senators and that's, that's uh, not voting, man. I'm talking. Hold about on, people. hold on, hold on. Yeah, I'm talking about kids. <laughs> hold on. So there was a whole Reconstruction where that when you get to Tulsa and all those things, it was a result of Reconstruction. We had a very, you know, what I'm saying. We had a very um, monumentous uh, uh, section of time then in the history of our people in this country. However, Andrew Jackson was also elected president during this, like recent, like right after this time, and he made sure that he did undid everything that was done to make sure that we were equal in this country. He gave, knowing that those wounds were still weren't healed. He undid everything. So when you talk about the Civil War, that's for And then the second point is, like wait, I said, because you wait, have, wait, 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 no, one second, one second, because I got it. You got to do counterpoint here, man. Right. So the second thing is when the president now, President Joe Biden asked for unity, he did say he did call those people domestic terrorists. The Department of Homeland Security knows that white supremacy of, and I'm sorry, white nationalism is the number one threat to and the number one actor of terrorist acts in this nation, but obviously under a Trump administration, that was not going to be seen to. So it's up to us to hold those people who hold those offices that we pay for accountable to make sure that they go after these groups that are terrorists. So I just want to make sure I get that out there that we're not just sitting here blasting. We're, we're, we're logical thinking people here, right? And we're going to use every tool in the tool shed. And so we know we're in, in here in America and we want to make sure that they go after, like you said, with they did dirty tricks to the Black Panther Party. David, in, in your in your Black Panther graphic novel, do you talk about the Cohen Pro Tell at all? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, how yeah. do we get gun control in California? Black people started taking up arms. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you something, and this is where I like a lot of people disagree with me, but they're all wrong. So um <laughs> The, the, one of the biggest lies that, that this this that's told to people is this philosophy that um, history is is won by the winners, right? And that ain't the truth. At least it's not the truth with the case of the Civil War, because all of our history, all of the U.S. history, has been written by the losers. It's all every uh, every book that we have, every textbook wow. that we have in this country is determined wow. and has been rewritten, has been edited so that it doesn't offend Boom. people from the Confederacy. So the theory, the hypotheses that I put out is that although slavery was abolished, the South won the Civil War. And if the South had actually lost, and if the North had actually had the backbone, and if white people actually had the backbone to stand by the victory that they claimed, oh, get up, Dave. What happened January sixth would never have happened. It couldn't have happened it because have happened. every every step along the way has been even even the response that we're seeing. People are shocked. They're outraged. How did this happen? How do we keep this from happening? What this? Well, is let's be clear. Happen. Let's be clear. White people are shocked. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and, but even there's even black folks who like, even though we claim that we're not shocked, we we're not looking at sort of this bigger picture, right? So when we talk about um, white nationalism and, and this rise of white nationalism, the thing that people have to understand is that that the country that we live in, that we think of as the, that we know as the United States, which started out as a colony of Great Britain, that was built on white nationalism, right? It wasn't called white nationalism back then because there was no nation. It was it was a colony, right? But when you look at all of the ideas of white superiority, and and we, we could say black inferiority or or the inferiority of color, all of that was used as justification for for slavery and for genocide and all the things that that make that that are the bad things in this country. But they're all the things that this country was built on, right? And, Which is inherent in the term colony. Yep. 
And, and, when, <laughs> and when we call it out, when we call it out, the first response that, that the perpetrators have is, you know, oh, well, you're, you're just being divisive, you know? And, and then the people that say, well, we should yeah, be I calling for David. unity. I, I love Dave. <laughs> I love it, Dave. It, it's like, yeah, I get that we should be calling for unity, but the problem is that those people over there, the people that were storming the Capitol, they don't want unity. They want us dead, right? So it becomes this, it, it, it's this huge moral dilemma. Now, I don't have an answer to it. But, but, but it, I believe it's white people's reluctance to condemn their own. Yes. So, like, if I have a child and my child is a murderer, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It is my. It, it like I raise. I raise the murderer. I have to. I have to condemn their act. You know what I mean? I might still love them. I. They definitely. The fact is, they're my child, but they're a murderer. They go out and murder people. Okay. So I think. Like you, like you said, you made the correlation between, you know, uh, the North won the war, but the South wrote the story. That's because the North was reluctant to condemn their brothers in the South. And it was reluctant to say these people have committed terrible uh, sins or, or, or what do they call those? Uh, crimes against humanity. Yeah. You take a, a race of people and murder, rape, breed, all type of stuff. Miseducate, lie to them, torture them. You know, these are crimes against humanity that they still have not reckoned for, that they're still walking around reaping the benefits. For, you know what I mean? That and I, and I will point, I will point out real quick, Pete. And I will point out real quick, Pete, because we got to plug Ed Food Foundation, which helps make this possible. Ed Food Foundation has uh, advocated for uh, our rights as indigenous people in this land and our, our indigenous brothers and sisters around the world. And one of the things that they made in their statements to the Human Rights Council was that uh, America is guilty of genocide and crimes against humanity in several statements to the Human Rights Council. So I just want to make sure we put that out there that this is being addressed. There are people who, who recognize this and who are taking this to what, like I said, using every tool in the tool shed, right? The United Nations is there. We're going to make sure we advocate there as well as we advocate nationally. So sorry when to interrupt you. Agree, you. But Sheldon, I understand, and that's the logical approach, right? But when you agree that these so-called white nationals, they have tools and things available to them. They did not choose to use these tools. They chose rage, fear, all these bully tactics that's and that's going to be their go-to bro they're not going to go to oh let's legislate black people out of existence they tried to do that let's let's make laws to say they can't you know what i mean nah they, they're done with that bro this new generation yeah, they, what, ran, they, they ran out they ran out of they're stuff not they... as smart. they're not as bright <laughs> as their fourth you know what i mean so they're going right back to their you know what i mean primitive roots <laughs> I, I think they just ran out of shit. You know, they hanging on, they hanging on by the fingertips. You know, and that's the only thing they can hold on to. You know. So, I mean? Doctor, it's like I'm so Doctor Lawana Richmond. If, if this is what give, I am, I'm gonna own it. <laughs> let's give Doctor Lawana Richmond a chance to respond to everything we've been saying. She's sitting there like she's she's typing, like making sure she don't forget <laughs> her key points. So let's give her a chance to respond, please, sister. Go ahead. Well, I mean, there's a few things. One, um, you know, part of the challenge and the reason they're so afraid, it's not just optics and a fear of um, losing political or social power. It's the very um, real fact when you start looking at population demographics, um, how do they continue to maintain the power and the control that they've had when they become less than, you know, a smid, when they become the absolute minority in this country? I, I, I totally agree with you there. Real quick, I just want so so that is a key point. And this is why you have all this white rage, right? Because they are actually in fact the minority. If you look at um if you look at population, if you look at uh what is it called? It's called uh when the, the, the birth rate, the birth rate, right? The birth rate of non of white white people is at a negative deficit meaning that within 15 to 20 years, they will not be able to produce enough of, they will not be able to produce enough white people to maintain like the, 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 you know, the statistics of where it is right now. They will be totally in the minority, even here in America. And they're already the minority in the world, right? So this is where a lot of this white rage is coming from. 
And so um, we do have to deal with that. But like, yo, we don't need to be babying people, right? I think uh, we, we talked about this last time. Somebody was like, hey, equality feels like oppression to me. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Welcome to the, the upside, the world land of the upside down. Yeah, I mean, equality is equality. The fact that you feel oppressed because you're you're put in a you start the race the same time as anyone else, that's your own inequalities. That's your own problems, man. Like, you know what I mean? And so we should not have to baby these people because again, to baby people and treat them like children, that's not democracy. That's not democracy. That's taking choice away from people. People have to deal with the very real truths that yes, you live in a multicultural world. The 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 statement by former Secretary of State Pompeo was abhorrent and it was it was horrible to hear like that. How did you get in a position to even say a statement like that? That multiculturalism is not what America is. Like that's just straight up ignorance, bro. And I mean, we got Paco from the Bronx. We got Mugnito from Chicago. You know what I mean? I'm sure on this, back in the day, there would be a different response to those types of statements. But we live in a new world, in a new, a new normal. So we have to deal with this as a, one, as a country, but more importantly, as a people. And like, we're all sitting here and having this great discussion. And I appreciate you all for doing that. And yes, Dr. Luana, please. I mean, me. but this is exactly why we have to pay attention because there are things being said, laws being written, things happening that when we're not um, engaged enough to know where things are and who is coming from what position, um, where we keep ourselves at a disadvantage. I mean, part of the reason I chose to stay engaged after the school board run is that I realized how many things are happening just in this little county that most people aren't paying attention to. That's and a great. We, yeah, and how do we sound the alarm so people know when to react? That's a great cool. point, and you you have something coming up called uh, the Dream Tank. Do you mind yeah. telling us about that? So the Dream Tank. So you know we're all familiar with think tanks. I um, I thought it would be a, an Afrofuturism Dream Tank, where basically I use art, music, um, like immersive, um, creative medium to evoke thoughts of the past and the present and inspire um, dreams of the future um, integrated with an art project where um, the audience is actually part of the event and they will share their dreams and their visions for the future and we'll have conversations about um, what are some actions we can take individually or collectively um, to make sure that the future we want we're tracking for a lot of times we're only thinking um you know some people are only thinking about their next paycheck that's the duration of their um their forward planning and you know if we really want to see systemic change and meaningful change even within our community we need to think more long term so that we make moves that may not make sense um in the short term but make great sense in the long term because when we're not here if we do the things we need to do, the generations that come after us will have a better experience. I feel like thank you. <laughs> I can't top that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where where can we find out more about the Dream Tank? When is it taking that, place? I mean, that, wait, wait, wait. That shit just sounds dope, though. You know what I mean? Like, because people throw out their ideas. It did like everybody could jump in there and, and say this and this and that. And then, you know, whittle it down and, you know, come up with something even better. You know, yeah, that's pretty dope right there. I just wanted to say that. Luana. So it's on Valentine's Day. All right. Um, and it. it's at UCSD. So the um, university is hosting me to do University that. of Cal San university Diego. California, San Diego um, to do as part of their craft center opening. So the craft center's theme is for the love of craft. And um, for me, I just think Lovecraft. <laughs> um, but the um, well, Lovecraft country, let's be specific. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then they're letting me be the anchor event. So that Sunday, um, the Afrofuturism Dream Tank will close it out. And so it's part um, art activity, um, just part fun. And um, so King Britt is a um, faculty member at UC San Diego. He was the first DJ for the Diggable Planets. He's provided like some music and depending on his dope, class load, dope. he may pop in. 
Um, Shami D is an alumni who does music and art and he worked with um, Elise Smith Cooper, who's a um, storyteller and um, educator and nurse and community activist to do these um, multimedia pieces called Spitting Truth to White Lightning. And so we'll be discussing that. And then um, Maharani Peace will be teaching people how to do some like marker art at the very beginning. Oh, and dope. the whole idea is for it to be fun and entertaining and for the people who aren't ready to get that deep, maybe they'll at least, you know, increase their awareness and get a different perspective. But the people who stay to the very end, um, it's going to be about that interaction. And throughout, I'll be creating space for people to um, think and, and ask questions and question um, what they've been presented with. That's see, that's the key. Just like David was saying, you know, when we first started, you just put it on. Like you have to mix it together, man. You can't just have like the most incredible text in the world. You're trying to read no pictures or nothing. You know, give them. You know, give the people something. I mean, when I, when I was a kid, with, with with comic books, it wasn't just looking at the uh the colors and the pages and all that. No, what I really loved about it is it taught me stuff. You know what I mean? I never, I never forget, man. I was watching uh just a Saturday morning cartoon, and. It, 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 I forgot exactly what character it was, but he he took his fire and he put it on the sand, and the sand became glass. You know what I mean? This was in the in the in the damn comic, you know. And I learned right there scientifically: if you you burn up some sand, you're gonna make some glass. You know what I mean? It, it's so, and that's just a small little thing. You know, I've learned so many words and just so much just from you know comics. So that's the way you do it. It's like a like I say, like a Flintstone vitamin, you know what I mean? That's 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 how that's how I write my rhymes. You know, I'm you know I'm an MC, so when I write my rhymes, I try to write them in a, like a, a Flintstone vitamin type of formula. You know, I, I want to give you something where you can latch on to, where you think that you're getting a treat, but it's it's fortified with vitamins and minerals. You know what I mean? Uh, just like you do your dog. You know, you want your dog to take a vitamin, you put it in that soft food. You know what I mean? You put it in that that meat and that mug gonna gobble it up. If you just put it out there in, in the soft food, he gonna look at you like you crazy. You know what I mean? It's the same thing, you know? And I just want to, you know, go back to that. David had put, had said something about that very early. Lawanda just, Lawanda just, you know, capped it off right there. And I just wanted to put that, you know, gloss on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so David, uh, speaking of that, uh, do you have uh, any other upcoming projects that you're thinking of outside of the Black Panther. I know Black Panther is hot off the <laughs> off the presses. I'm not trying to push you to your next project, but you know, this is definitely something everywhere. And you can't see it because of my background, but you know, <laughs> it, when we edit it, you'll be able to see it. But anyway, in front of your face, the um, focus is it really? Yeah. 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 Can you see it? There you okay. There you go. There you go. Yo, that's hot off the presses, and that's and that's a great graphic novel because you know a lot of times you get a graphic novel and or a comic book about the history of something and it's a little too short yeah so this has man this is this has got enough girth this got enough information for anybody that's interested on a like you know what i'm saying you want to give your kid and let them know about the black panther like y'all said like they ain't gonna read the book man they're not gonna read the book i mean i i know growing up i had to read the book you know solo and ice i was forced blood in my eye you know what i mean but i give my kids this they're gonna read this they're going to be like, OK, I'm engaged. And so uh, I thank you for writing that. And um, you. You just do you have any ideas for any other ones that you're thinking of doing? Yeah, I've got a, a couple projects that I'm, I'm developing and, and one that I'm working on right now that I, I can't, of course, can't talk about it. Yet. Right, it's right. <laughs> um, but one of the things I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to figure out a way to um, either you know convince more publishers to do more stuff like this uh, this nonfiction stuff or, or figure out a way to get myself in a position to green light some stuff. Cause there's a lot of projects that I'd like to do that a, I don't have the time to do, you know, cause it takes a lot of time to do research and, and the writing and all that. And, and I don't have the money to do it. Um, but you know, like I, I would, as much as I would like to read a graphic novel about Ida B. Wells, I would, yeah, I, I'd, I'd much rather read a graphic novel about Ida B. Wells than write one. Right, because I know the amount of time and energy and research that goes into writing one of these things. Man, Once in a yeah. while, you just want to sit back and read them, right? But right. you know, when I look at like, uh, but but I, I I speak about Ida B. Wells specifically because this is somebody who 
you know, I, I knew a little bit about her, but when I was doing my research on the Frederick Douglass book, I, I, you know, ended up reading quite a bit about her and was like, yo, this person's life is amazing, you know? And, and what I've learned along the way is that there's, there's a lot of people that we might know their names and we might know a little bit about something that they did, but we ultimately don't know that much or enough. Man, and, you are, you are and, exactly and so that's, right. So that's exactly what I'd like right. to see, you know. Because I, mean, I, I could tell you right now, we have we have a whole projects named IDB Wells Projects in Chicago, and I don't know nothing about it. You know? Yeah. Oh man, anti lynching man. Listen, IDB Wells was, was a heavyweight, yo, no doubt. And so it's a lot of it's about trying to figure out um, a, a unions. Out she was into the unions. Oh, yeah, she yeah, was everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man. She's a heavyweight. She's a heavyweight. See, that's, that's, see, that's sure. beautiful. That's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and right, as on, long as, right on here with it. And as long as other people tell our history, they're never really going to tell us how truly gangster our heroes were. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <of> <laughs> Martin Luther King light. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, even yeah, that's that's very true. We get the um, and and I you know I learned this working on the Black Panther book was that you know, um, and I talk about this in the very beginning of the book. There's like the legend, there's the myth of the Panthers, and then there's who they really were, and and you know we have this um, th there's a difference between what I call the the myth of history and the reality of history, and so what we're taught in this country is history as a myth. Um, we're taught, you know, that George Washington's one of the founding fathers, but they never talk about the fact that George Washington owned slaves, right? They, they talk about how Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, but they don't talk about the fact that Abraham Lincoln's original plan when he freed the slaves was to put them on boats and send them back to Africa because he didn't want them here, right? Liberia. So, yeah, so we get, we have the, the, the myth and the myth feels good. You know what I'm saying? The myth is like, oh, it's, and, and the South, understands the power of the myth. The Confederacy understood the power of the myth because they wrote the myth of the lost cause. They wrote the myth of, oh, we're fighting for states' rights, period, as opposed to we're fighting for states' rights, comma, to have slaves. Right? That's <laughs> what it's all about. So, so I, I just want to try to find ways to, um, to unpack some of the myths and, and present them as, as the truths. And, you know, it's... Um, we, we, unfortunately, I've, I've chosen a path that ain't the easiest, but that's all right. You know, like, like who wants an easy, uh, who wants to take the easy road? You know, that's, that's, that, that's never as fun. Right, and, right. And, and that's, that's why I love you, Dave, because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm from the same cloth. I'm cut from the same cloth, you know, I mean? just to, analytically, you know, I, I could have woke up and, and tried to be Nelly, like at, <laughs> at 20. No, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not Nelly. I'm here to tell you something that you probably don't want to hear. You yep. know what I mean? And that's just the passion. And I really enjoy that, that you have that mindset, especially in the journalism, you know, area, because we are so lacking in that area. You know, it's so whitewashed, you know, that, you know, people don't even know what's well, going on. Well, let's, let's, let's be clear, though. It is out there. It's just our, we need to make sure we bring it to the forefront. And yeah, so that's what we do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And real quick, so what David says, like we're taught the myth. So um, I always like to drop a book or something where other people get more information about that. Lies My Teacher Told Me, a great book that tells you about how the textbooks are written in America and how they teach you the myth rather than they teach you reality. You know what I mean? Um, but Mugnito, you you said something like you you try to you try to do what like you know what I'm saying with the music you try to keep it real and so we're gonna go to a musical moment with Mugnito oh, so we can get <laughs> okay. you ready for that yeah I don't know if I because like that. as a people we're like yo so edutainment should be the theme of twenty of the decade honestly because we're a type of people man we're not all about that that like stuffy and you know what I'm saying? We like to be, we like to be free. We like to um, be artistic. We like to express ourselves. And so um, edutainment is something that is really important. Um, and uh, so I know why I brought this brother on and I'm so glad that he's a part of Afronauts. So we're gonna get into baby. it. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna get into it. A musical moment with Mokenito. There you go. It's all you bro. Oh snap. You know, first how I started, you know, uh, peace and love to the Holy Ghost, my brother. And uh, my greatest, one of my greatest inspirations in hip hop, MF Doom, rest in peace. 
Uh, Nito, you dig? I try to, uh, when I spit, you know, it's pretty much true stories and comic funk. That's what you get. True stories and comic funk. You know what I mean? Most cats, you know, they tell you fake stories in reality. You know, I, I flip it. You know what I mean? And, you know, I try to cover everything that's in my life. You know, you got you got love of your life. You got community. You got you, your passion, you know. And this particular song, I've, I managed to pretty much put them all into one thing. You know what I mean? So, you know, check it out. Enjoy it. It's called Slept On. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah. <laughs> you dig. Accurate as Kaepernick. Is Micah like the wick that'll burn down your candlestick? With some scientifical babble shit that's unequivocally talented and analytically accurate. Under the tightest specifications and in accordance to all vocarian regulations. I grab the mic and then I spans out. All I gotta do is touch your neck. You will pass out. Cold. And when the story's told, I be at home with your shorty. Cow they be gold. Coin a phrase like a leprechaun. Sharp enough to rip the wings off a Megatron. Stomp a rapper in my octagon Didn't have tea with the queen of ancient Babylon I'm here to paint the pantalon My artist upper echelon Sharp as a deputant Right now she can't see me She's sleepy So deep, so soon, so creepy Love. Damn, how do I show her? It's kinda hard to do when I barely even know her All I know is when she's gone I'm alone, in a zone Why am I staring at my phone? Home is exactly where you're standing at Say the word and I'll be happy to handle that Tackle that like a lineman with a fish hook But this time, she the blind man and I'm the thick book Quick look, there go needle with the missus Hugs and kisses as they share elegant dishes The world becomes irrelevant and time equals that in value I wrote this to wow you, bow down and crown you I found you, vow to be the last standing My love could fill the Grand Canyon Who would have thought out of 42 missions The first to explore like 24 other dimensions that he would find a creature so compatible, factual, with a voice that's nothing less than magical. With no use for the theatrical, unless it's on the mic where it comes so natural. Mm. Like the hair that she braids, I'm here to give her props like a chair on the stage. Mm. I'm enjoying our orbit, all up in your business like my middle name was Carpenter. Your convo, your phone calls, leave me standing there looking square, holding my own balls. Mm. Now how do I play this off, take this off? Come here, baby, make it so. I'm just playing with your fine ass. We'll get back to that. Let me pour more in your wine glass. Ain't it funny how the time passed? Bad gas, I pass, and high grass, and long roads. Mm. Couldn't keep me from a frozen tundra. Turn it to Indian summers. We can get married in Europa, the moon of Neptune, whichever one is doper. And I ain't just trying to tear you off. And I know too much pressure might scare you off. But damn, my input is peaking, and I wrote this to let you know that you were sleeping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. <laughs> Yo, you gotta play the claps for yourself, bro. Yeah, I hope she hears you. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta play the claps for Yeah, 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 bro. That was that was uh, that was liquid fire right there. That was that was indeed, indeed. Yeah, no doubt, man. You did. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, Nito, man, what was it? So your inspiration for that was? I had, you know, I had just met this lovely lady, man. And I was feeling myself, you know what I mean, as the villain. <laughs> and uh, I, I, she wasn't really feeling me, you know what I mean? And, you know, and that's just like, to me, that's been like the microcosm of my whole Hip hop life, you know what I mean. So I put it into a, you know a song. You know how you do it. That's what artists do. You, 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 you know, you heal yourself with your art. You know what I mean. That's art is healing. That's, uh, that, that's what it was all about, right there. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. No doubt, we appreciate that. That was on fire. That was on point. Yeah, art is healing, and I want to say, like you know, um, and that's one of the reasons we started Afronauts because you know, um, 
you know, like I said, we're an expressive people. And a lot of times we've put our pain into our art and that helps us to move on. There's so many, you know, examples of that when you like look at our great jazz musicians and, yeah. you know, like Richard Pryor, right? Like, you know, you they put that pain into the art and then they, they give us this genius thing, you know what I'm saying? And um, I feel to me, like going forward and, you know, in, this, in the next generations, we need to understand that. And at the same time, we need to uh, make sure that we have outlets and we take care of our people and take care of our artists. Because in the past, all that's happened is other people have come and capitalized on our talent and their pain and not taking care of those people. And therefore they've gotten rich, man. Like, so hip hop is something that's like all over the world now. And uh, we basically, last weekend we did was that last weekend we did uh we did yeah. the Heart Heart Tuzani Virtual yeah. Poetry Cafe and we had people from New Zealand, uh, uh from India on and you know that hip hop connection is real it's, it's strong you know what I mean so hip hop uh, is so great because it allows almost anybody that can actually speak to you know to to heal like you say you know what I mean it's it's not like like singing you have to actually be able to hold a note you know <laughs> it's not the case of hip hop if you can open your mouth you can get that pain out you know what I mean on the on the beat or whatever that's why that's why it's going to always be here every generation is going to clutch on to it because because of that exact you know reason you know what I mean it's it's never going to go anywhere you know it's like all these other genres you know, they fade off. No, hip hop is always going to be there because it gives a voice to everybody. Right, right. That's the beauty of it. And the thing I want to say is that like hip hop is so, so it's really when you when you come to dealing with black people and I, I want to get David and uh, Luana's uh, uh, opinion on this. When you come to dealing with black people, like we're calling this hip hop, but we could call it Afrofuturism. We could call it jazz. We could call it rock and roll. Like we just create art, right? And we can't be defined by tiny little boxes. So like, you know what I'm saying? Like, cause you, you know, you know, back in the day, like you'll use something in hip hop that comes from rock and roll. You'll use something, you know, in Afrofuturism that may be cyberpunk, right? And so like, it's just our nature to be creative and expressive. And so therefore I think it's important that we realize that is one of our greatest strengths and, and we should make sure we, uh, uh, utilize that moving forward. So I just wanted to get your opinions on that, David and Luana. I don't know <laughs> what your thoughts are. Luana, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Well, you're talking, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that the, 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 the story of the Black existence in America is the story of creating something from nothing. Ooh. And uh, I remember when I was a kid, my grandfather talking to me about the food he ate growing up and, and talking about chitlins. Yeah. And, and my grandfather hated chitlins, right? And, and <laughs> he explained to me that, you know, because chitlins were, the, were, were garbage. They were, they were the things that, it was made of things that white people discarded and did not want to eat. And, and that we had to, as a people, we had to find a way to make it palatable, right? And, and so I, that always stuck with me, right? And, I, and then I started thinking about jazz and I started thinking about, especially with hip hop, because when you look at what hip hop grew out of, it was, it was people making something out of things that weren't supposed to be used that way. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you look at the history of DJs and, and, and the break beats and all that stuff. That's not what the stuff was supposed to be. Someone getting up on a microphone talking isn't supposed to be music. Sampling isn't supposed to be an art form. Um, and, and all of our existence in this country has been uh, about finding ways to survive in, in against all odds and, and finding a way to express ourselves and survive when, when nothing is given to us. You take, how do we turn trash into art, you know? And how do we, and, and because here's the thing, we as human beings, our existence in this country is based on the denial of our humanity, right? Yes. Like that's the only way you can enslave a people is you deny them their humanity. So part of our existence has been trying to, and we're doing it every day, every single day, trying to define our humanity, trying to create a humanity for ourselves that, that some people don't want to give us. And, and the, the, the thing is, is that a lot of us can't articulate it. 
And a lot of the people that are denying it to us can't articulate it either. So how do you realize, how do you recognize a problem? How do you correct a problem if you can't even figure it out? And, and but I, I think that, you know, when I think about hip hop, I always think about something from nothing. And I think about that, you know, cause I'm old enough to remember when hip hop was young, right? And I remember when it was a fad and, right. and it wasn't yeah. gonna last, you know? That's what my dad said. He told me those exact <laughs> words, Dave, exact words. It's 50 years later. Right there, exactly, man. exactly. <laughs> and it's like, no, no, this is like, this wasn't a fad. This was, this was a certain group of people finding their voice. Now that voice has changed and evolved over time, you know. Now a, a whole bunch of different groups of people have adapted it. Yes, exactly. As the voice, you know what I mean. So I, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me because I, I'm one of them cats who's who's really stuck in in the past in terms of hip hop. You know, I, I listen to a lot of contemporary stuff and I'm like, ah, I don't get this, you know, yeah. but I'll put on Eric B and Rakim and I exactly. will just like, that's it. Ain't nothing wrong with that either. Man. Yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah. and it's because that's my my generation. And I feel like when I'm talking to younger people, I'll be like, yo, hey, what are you listening to? And then I'll say, okay, now you listen to this. And then we share, there's that exchange, yes, right? Yes. So yeah, I just, I think that that we need to understand that that our existence in this country and now on a global level is really defined by us having to find ways to survive against, you know, all kinds of attacks. And, and you know, it's funny, you almost made, for what, I, for what you just said, black is almost should be like equal to hip hop, like synonymous with hip hop, just being black, you know? It's an mean? extension, it's all, you know, because- extension. Yeah, be because yeah, because we take, I, something, we take something from nothing and make something, you know what yeah. I mean? All the, that's what I got out of what you said. In my opinion, what David just described and beautifully articulated was the love story of hip hop. What about how hip hop has been weaponized? Okay. One, one second, one that's, second. We gotta that's get- That's why I we love gotta, Pete, man. Pete, and Pete ain't playing. That's, that's, <laughs> We got to get Luana's take first before we talk about <laughs> hip hop being weaponized. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> Hold that thought. But let, let, let's, uh, Luana, go ahead. You, um, you let David go first. So go, you, you go ahead now. Well, yeah. And, and I probably shouldn't have because he was so eloquent. Who wants to follow that? <laughs> um, but, you know, I will start with like one of, um, you know, it was a, I think it was a KRS one line We will be here forever. Forever and ever, forever and ever. Forever. Yeah, I, and I guess that breaks it down, really, at the end of the day, all the way to the last. To melanin. You path. <laughs> I mean, from the beginning to the end, and and hip hop to me represents that that whole adaptability. And I've watched hip hop reinvent itself, and I've seen you know the the reference to like the weaponization of hip hop, and I think even though it's not obvious hip hop is finding its way back to where it was supposed to be. Yes, uh, you, you see it, you see it, you see it. It's, yeah, it's and, um, it's and, and before, I, oh, oh, go on. It's our, it's, our, it's our way of communicating where we are and what we're feeling. And, and we, you know, there you go. You know now that I'm old, <laughs> I, and I, you know, my grandson was the picture that, you know, I use on my um, profile when I'm not on camera. Um, being able to let understand that young people every generation thinks that their ideas are new ideas and that exactly. no one has had that experience exactly. no one has had that idea and hip-hop is one of the ways that they process and go through it right. and i think for me i listen to contemporary music maybe it's because i work in higher ed i do a lot of work with young people to understand where they're coming from because if you're yeah. trying people where they are it's like the voice of a generation right. and i think it will continue to it be it will always be like that Luana. that's why i try to explain to people as far as hip hop it, it, it's going to always be a a, a preponderance on the on the uh, sex drugs and violence it's always going to be that because every generation is new to the world they're new to it so they're going to be rebellious and the, and one of the most rebellious ways they're going to do it is going to be sex drugs and violence every generation every generation that comes here is going to exploit that before they become like you say wise older where they can 
understand life and then it becomes something different. But that initial experience is always going to be freaky tales, too short, you know what I mean? Cardi B, uh, whatever the hell, uh, two live crew. It's got to be that first because we sexual beings and, 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 and rebe rebellious as kids. So as long as you're a rebellious kid, it's going to be, you know, the opposite of society, you know? So that's, you got to, you got to put that already into the math because that's going to happen every generation. It's not going to be a generation to come here and say, Hey, you know what? We're rolling with y'all. But how, <laughs> much, how much of that though comes from the fact that we feed our kids lies. And we yeah, are that's true too. That's lies. true too. But I, I, but, I, but see, I would tell you like this though, you could go to like a homogenous society that doesn't allow nothing. You know what I mean? And you're gonna have rebellion, man. Yeah. It's gonna be some rebellion. As soon as you be, are born, you are, it, and it's 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 a healthy thing because if we didn't have that, we'd be stagnant. Hold up, hold up. I happen to go to a homogenous society, somewhat. It was, you know, what I'm saying. So I was invited to New Zealand by the Maoris, and um, nah, it's not like that. I mean, you know, what I'm saying they have a segment of they have gangs in, in, in uh, you know, what I'm saying they have gangs down there in New Zealand and everything. But if you look at the majority of the music, like, and and their culture, because their culture feeds pride and positivity, yeah, and and and, and they're they're grasping to overcome colonization, and so their whole culture as being Mari is tied to Mari is great, Mari is positive. Their music and things like that, they don't have that same. Yeah, but but I would I would challenge you on this though. If you go and get the older Maoris and then put it with the the the, the younger ones, it's gonna be some dissension in there as far as even if it's the simplest shit, it's gonna be some type of rebellious towards the older shit. That, that's I change. would say that their rebellion is against colonization because they recognize that that colonization was was a direct threat to themselves and their culture and and you can find that in a lot i mean and and like i'm saying and this is the whole thing as far as identifying as an indigenous person because i personally you can look for my paper on this but um there's indigenous citizens and there's corporate citizens now if you're a corporate citizen what you said bugnito is exactly right because a corporate citizen is someone that identifies with the corporate state now, when I had the pleasure of meeting the uh, the, Ma the Machu Picchu people out of Chile, mm -hmm. and we were having a conversation, and I was like, oh, yeah, yo, Alexi Sanchez, like, the Chile team is doing good this year. He's like, nah, we don't call it Chile, bro. It's still Machu. You know what I'm saying? It's still our land. We don't identify but, but, with but Chile. You, That's just the colonizer that took us over. You know what I'm saying? Course, so, of course, uh, but see, you talking about you talking about a section version. It's like it's like going to the 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 people that still address themselves as Black Panthers in the U.S. And, and seeing how they roll. Of course, because that's a you know what I mean. That's that's a people that's educated, that's that's familiar, that's specialized. And, and of course, that's gonna go like that. I'm talking about the general population of the masses. You know what I mean? It's always gonna be a dissension. Definitely. Between between generations it's gonna happen it, 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 in the u.s is it's over compensated <laughs> you know what i mean by the social media and all the bullshit that goes on it, but of course i know what you said yeah of course i guess i know people you know in my own family just you know they're they not going for the bullshit you know like me like for since birth but i'm not talking about them i'm talking about just the average everyday person on the planet when they're born they they it's just a something there's something in us well because they, they're entering the matrix they're right, entering right. a colonized they, they, system they that's already, already established yeah, yeah, exactly. right right yeah. which is why we have the color wars you might say as well right oh you got light skin or you got that good right, hair right, right? right. And, and that that translates that translates to Asian countries. Uh, that translates to that's all what, over the planet. That's, that's because saying. that's the predominant, right? But you got to realize we're the majority. And and I understand what you're saying at the ascension, but we have to make it so that people ha have that choice. 
to say, I don't want to be a part of that corporate. And that's the thing without saying that. I want to be an indigenous. How do I do that? Yeah. And what does that look like? You know what I mean? Exactly. Real quick, real quick, I want to show David this. I think I should share this. And I want to share with all of y'all real quick. But I think I shared this with David on his uh, uh, Facebook, bro. This is when I was in New Zealand. This is uh, uh, the Te Kahau Taranga Ta. He, um, youth center. They are a hip hop dance group, and they came to Arizona for the hip hop dance championships. And uh, when I went there, yo, know, they 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 gave me. They were really they really welcomed me there, and I and I appreciate them. They gave me this like really this uh, Maui's hook. I don't know if you saw Mo Moana, uh, that that Disney Pixar movie, but they gave me this like really awesome like uh, Emerald Maui hook um and but while i was there i was like well let me give you something and so as you can see here i gave them <laughs> david walker's shaft comic book nice <laughs> nice you know what i mean i want to let them know <laughs> yeah 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 so i want to let them know like yo this is how we get down i also gave them um niobe from stranger comics you know what i'm saying shout out to sebastian um, but um, yeah, so I, so there there are people out. So that hip hop is worldwide, man, and our culture is worldwide. We we are creators, we're civilizers, and we should be proud of what we do. And we should offer people that other outlet to to not have to deal with um, the weaponization of hip hop. And so with that, let's get back to that point that Pete said. Go ahead, Pete. You talk about weaponization of hip hop. I was ready for my final thought, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I think. laughs> you know, you know, is we we could. I, I don't want to. I don't want to sound like unappreciative of everything you guys have said, but I I kind of disagree. I think that hip hop started out as a cool culture, and you know, we allowed it to be inclusive which was part of its, in my opinion, downfall of the culture. Therefore, now you see, uh, I go on YouTube and I, and I put in uh, hip hop dancing and I see groups of kids in Switzerland break dancing on their neck, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, the only way you gonna find some footage of it, of, you know, is from like one of those 80s breaking movies or Beach Street or something like that. You can't find anybody that originated our culture uh, doing well because of it. Like and I know, and I'll, I'll agree with oh, you there because oh, oh, that's a that's a whole nother show, right? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I agree with you there because to show. get the funding, to get the funding to have like kids in our community do hip hop dancing, that's a yeah, yeah, and then the fact that. We move on so fast from things, right? Oh, someone, someone's, wait, they're doing it in Switzerland like that? Man, listen, let, let's create this new thing. Let's do something new now, right? And so they may not even want to do break dancing like that anymore. But you do still have some some true heads out there. I, I, I hear what you're saying there. Um, and so I didn't mean to be inflammatory by saying it's weaponized. But when I say, I don't mean to. No, but you're right. It is weaponized. When you have people that, um, when you, so one of the things that boggle my mind is like, so you have like Sony and a couple other, they all stock in private prisons. And some of their top artists talk about uh, slinging drugs and shooting people, right? So it's almost like you're advertising to, sit, to get people to do this so they can go to your private prison. For them. Yeah, exactly. It's common knowledge right now. If you have an artist that's uh, very controversial and is just very crazy and does a whole bunch of retarded shit, that you're gonna sell a lot of records. This is common knowledge. Like even you know in the boardrooms, you know, so they looking for these people. Just like the reality shows, you know, you're not you're not gonna go get a reality show with a bunch of boring people. You know what I mean? You're gonna go get reality show with the most controversial you know, people you can have. You know what I mean? Some would say we had a reality show in the White House. Exactly. Uh, if I can, I want to interject because because like what Paco's saying is actually right on point. But and and I say something similar, but I say it slightly differently, which is weaponization is a good word, 
but I, I prefer commodity, right? Ooh. So there's hip hop there as an art. Me too. I like and it. then there's hip hop as product. Yeah, and, and, name, and we've lost very early on, hip hop went from being art. I remember when it wasn't even called hip hop, to be honest with you, but it, it's, it's gone to being something that's bought, sold, traded, right? Yeah, it is, and it's yeah. this idea of, of what hip hop is. And more importantly, oftentimes, it's an idea of what, especially when we're talking about black folks in America, what black folks are supposed to be, right? Mm. And and because I know every single one of us knows whether it's either a, an MC or an or or a group that like some brothers will be like, yeah, that's not real hip hop. That's some nerd shit. That's the exactly. you know whether it's you know um exactly. uh, uh, I, I mean I'm trying to like like uh oh you know, all that backpack rap ba back exactly pack you know hey, Dave let, let, let me interrupt you for one second I just want to interject this. And this one, it really pisses me off. It's kind of controversial. But, you know, it bothers me that, that, that you know, you get the, the Eminem. Eminem could get on there and be the most nerdiest motherfucker in the world, say the most craziest shit in the world, and black people will put him up like he is the god. But let a black person be... Cannabis? <laughs> Cannabis? Let a black person, Mook Nito, be Eminem. Hey, yeah, Mook Nito. And, and, and it's nothing. It, it, it's not even it's nerd rap like you say it's 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 something beneath hey de la soul for years de la soul was labeled nerds and they're they're weirdos right exactly but Eminem, he can he can say whatever he want to say and, and be the most great hey so so i think dave and luana y'all could definitely speak to this we're not allowed to be ourselves Boom. we're supposed to be that stereotype that David was just talking about. There you go. It's a great documentary about step and fetch it, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's that can that's a good metaphor for for hip hop because you know there are a lot of artists that are saying real things and they get told they're not black enough, they need to be more gangster. You know, where's the sex? Where you know exactly? Basically, they won't sell. Exactly. It was exactly. Exactly. It's up to us to create that space to allow us to be us. You know what I mean? Because and and, and that's what Lawanda is talking about with the dream to, dream tank. So hold on, hold on. That's what Lawanda is talking about with the dream tank coming up. You know what I mean? On Valentine's Day. Uh, and what is the website, Lawanda, that we can find out about that? So, um, I haven't put the link out. I'm lagging, but if you go to drlawanda.com and just um, hit the subscribe button. As soon as I send it out, you'll be included in the list. And Afronauts will be sure to uh, uh, to share any information in regards to that. But go ahead, Budila. Go ahead. Uh, and you know, you know. To be fair, you know, uh, you know, like you say, black people. They, for some reason, you know, I guess because of the gangster rap and all that stuff, we have this vision of what hip hop is. You know what I mean? And if it's not fitting that vision, then it's not hip hop. You know what I mean? But that was early. I was telling people that was early. I think we starting to evolve, you know, as far as that comprehension of what hip hop is. And, and I'm starting to see it come around. You know, it's slow. <laughs> it's, it's finally happening. It probably should have happened like 20 years ago. But I think I think we starting to really come around to what's happening. You know what I mean? I got a really important question. This is for Paco. What's the name of the Step and Fetch It documentary? Because I got it. <laughs> it was it was actually on PBS. I'm gonna get it. Hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> oh, Step and Fetch It was a millionaire, but he, and he hated his role. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But you know, he, the, like the minstrel show, man, that you couldn't get on unless you. Unless oh yeah. You played the game, like a little Richard to tell you. You know, say they they what they they loved him because. I'm gonna go. He didn't have no problem. You're on my TV. You let me go. <laughs> he didn't have no foul, no problem fitting into what they needed. You know, somebody that, that wasn't uh, threatening. You know what I mean to it's, that to that community. You know what I mean. It's um, it's interesting to me because Parallels between Little Wayne and Step and Fetch it. I don't know shade on Little Wayne's name. You know, I'm sure yeah. there's fans of his out there. You know what I mean? But like, like it's it's it was. Like the the similarities were almost like like sad, you know. What I mean? <laughs> but I'm gonna find it, man. Okay. But uh, 
kind of it kind of leads me in like what I wanted. I wanted to discuss two topics today in my segment. What's next? And believe me, I got a lot of work to do on this. I see how unprepared I was today. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all you, Paco. Man. You be, yeah, we 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 yo, 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 you trying to you you walk hey, 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 let's get Paco. Paco's uh, a single I'm, I'm, Paco's a single dad though, so I, we gonna really come a little him, bit of slack. I ain't giving him no slack people? because he know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Paco slack. reminds me of the senior who says, "It should now now you want to you now you want to start talking like let's get it going." Paco, Go uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let, let's let Luana talk now. Wait, wait, wait. The singer who gets up and says, you know what, my throat is bothering me. You know, <laughs> I'm not really going to be able to do anything today, but here, you're doing great, Paco. Thank you. <laughs> I love Paco. I just want him to be free. Last topic was, uh, um, and it kind of, I think it, it, it plays a little bit into what we're talking about, what's happening in hip hop, but um, uh a brief critique of the de directorial debut of Regina King in the mo new movie One Night in Miami. Oh, so I've oh, I heard about that. You saw it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. What's, give me the Paco review. Man. Take take your time watching it, brother. It's not a must watch. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 fictional. It's a fictional account. I mean, Paco's out of five. <laughs> How many Pacos out of five? Oh, I get two Pacos. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's it, it's it's uh a night in Miami is a fictional account of. It was actually true that Martin Luther, excuse me, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay at the time were at the same fight. All of these four gentlemen were purported to be at the same fight, but it's fictional and it's based off of a play. Um, I'm still doing a little research on it, but, um, did you see the, uh, the Netflix one with the, the, the lady singer, uh, recently had, oh, you talk about, uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Oh, hold on. You can't, don't, don't, dis favorite. don't distract, don't distract Paco, man. Like let him finish his, his thought here. <laughs> no, he did finish it. no, no. Let him finish. Go ahead. Go ahead, Paco. See. I think it'll be better in a better conversation once the movie's been out for a while and people have had a time to digest it and it's had some, you know, some. No, nah, you the first, so you watch it. Be the first commentary, bro. Don't wait for somebody. Yeah. I, I didn't. He, he said his commentary. He said, take time. Take no, no, time. no. He's not done. We had this conversation. Let, let, let him finish. Go. I wanted to discuss how. Um, there are, I guess, parallels between the activism or lack thereof. That's what the whole thing is about, about oh. Malcolm X uh, giving these three obvious juggernauts, entertainers, Sam Cooke, Jim Brown, and Cassius Clay, giving them some sort of pep talk. Hey, you need to use your platform to be more active. Oh, and then, and then they all got, they all get to get their perspective. Yeah, they like to money right now I, I don't know if really the time is bad Malcolm you know what I mean yeah. let me get my money first let me you know then every to me well maybe I'm paraphrasing it wrong I, I y'all just watch it but um I wanted to see how or so you got Kaepernick right the pol we're talking about the polarizing ones Kaepernick right he gets down on one knee right right obviously he's sacrificing he's martyring himself his career for, you know, police. Uh, I believe his, it was originally yeah. police brutality. That's what he took the knee for. Um, I wanted to compare their sacrifice, you know, because, you know, there were a group of athletes. I believe it was Jim Brown. I think it was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. All of them got together back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, and they had a huge press conference. Yes, they did, yes. And I said, you know what I mean? Enough is it. Let's stop the shit. You know what I mean? You know, there's a fine line between going out and then entertaining somebody and then watching your people be mistreated and slaughtered. And if you don't speak up, if you don't use your platform to speak out against it, then you're just as bad as the people. You know what I mean? You just and that, and that's what that's that's what Kyrie going through right now. It's it's in his brain. Yeah, and that's where I say the parallels are. We have to have that discussion to discuss. You know what I mean? 
is is Kyrie gonna give up his right. I don't know whatever contract he got right. to be the face of to, to be the lead. That's a hard one, man. That's a hard one right there, man. I, you know, for me, you know, I really appreciate what he's doing. You know what I mean? And what what he's doing? You know, I really do. But at the same time. I don't expect no man to do that. You know what I mean? You got family, man. You got, we, we so far, far behind in generation of wealth and all the other shit that's jumping off. It might not be the time for that. You know what I mean? You can say what you say, but you know, well, the whole thing. Right now when? Oh, you might, it might be your, your grandson. It might be your nephew, you know, or something like that. But you got established. I don't know where he come from. I don't know what his family got. You know what I mean? But it's different for everybody. You know, I know me, my, my family ain't had nothing ever. Like my, my grand, my dad was the greatest uh, male I know in my family. And he, he, uh, he uh, worked at the post office his whole life. It, it, you know what I mean? Retired from that. So that was like the greatest, that's the greatest height that we have in our family. You know what I mean? So I can't, I don't know what's going on in, in Kyrie family. You know what I mean? So you know, it, it, it's different for everybody. It, 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 you got to really, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. You know what I mean? It's, it's what hey, it yo, is. so so I know David's got to go pretty soon, but I do want him to be able to weigh in on this. As P said, if not now, then when? Um, go ahead, David. Well, you know, as, as it relates to One Night in Miami, I, I saw the film and, and by and large, I liked it. Paco, don't ever uh, apologize for not liking something or, or say you're waiting for other people to, to try to convince you otherwise. Um, you know, the, but because the word you touched upon was fictionalized, right? This is not what really happened. Um, there's a show on Epics called The Godfather of Harlem, and I love that show, but ain't a single thing in that show true and real and honest, right? Other than the fact that Adam Clayton Powell was real and Bumpy Johnson was real and Malcolm X was real. So we have to, like as a society, and this just isn't as black folks, I'm talking on, on a global level, we have to learn how to separate entertainment from you know, history. Um, and, and you know, there's parts of One Night in Miami that I, I, I had problems with, but by and large, I, I was just entertained, you know? And that was the important thing. And, and, but what I hope is that whether people like it or don't like it, they use it as an opportunity to, to dig into the truth, right? And to go, okay, what was Sam Cooke's relationship with Muhammad Ali? What was Malcolm X's relationship with Jim Brown? What really, you know, because the only thing, we, nobody knows what went down that night. You know, it, it's this sort of speculative thing so it's more like science fiction or speculative fiction than anything else. Um, you, going back to Step and Fetch It, Step and Fetch It wasn't in that movie, but Step and Fetch It was there. Step and Fetch It was at that Sonny Liston fight, and and um, he had, he was part of Ali's corner. You know, he he helped in Ali's training, which people it blows people's mind when you when you talk about that. So I just feel like, you know, to me, everything is an opportunity to go learn something. And, and I remember seeing, um, going to see Malcolm X when it came out in theater, Spike Lee's Malcolm X in the early 90s. And, and a lot of folks running around thinking they knew a lot about Malcolm X because they saw a two hour movie. And it's like, no, 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 that was the beginning. Now you need to go read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Now you need to study his life, study who he was, what he was all about. And you can't just study what Malcolm was talking about when he was in the Nation of Islam as opposed to what he was talking about after he left the nation. That's like only knowing what Malcolm was talking about when he was still, you know, Chicago Red. Like you have to know the whole bigger picture. So, you know, I, I, I enjoyed One Night in Miami. I think that it's a great opportunity for people to go, oh, who was Malcolm X? Oh, who was Sam Cooke? Oh, who was, who was Cassius Clay? And more importantly, who was um, Muhammad Ali? You know, what, how did, how did Cassius Clay become Muhammad Ali? Who was Jim Brown? And how the hell did Jim Brown come to, you know, endorse Donald Trump? I mean, he, like, <laughs> like there's that question. So I think that the, the, the key is, is if, if we respond to something, whether it's positive or negative, we, part of what we need to do is we need to understand why we're responding positively or why we're responding negatively, take it apart you know, listen to it, you know, the, 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 you go back to hip hop. I mean, how many of us, you know, 
the first time we ever heard of, of whether it was Malcolm X or Asada Shakur or someone like that, how many of us the first time we ever heard about them was, was in a rap song? You know what I'm saying? And, and that's what we choose to do with what is presented to us positively or negatively, it's up to us as individuals. And, and, and so what we should be doing is cultivating both ourselves and the people around us to be a little bit more critical and go, okay, you know, again, who was Sam Cooke? Was, was why, what motivated him to write that song? Because it's true, he did write, you know, A Change Is Gonna Come based on his feelings about Bob Dylan's song but was it Malcolm X who put that album on the turntable and said, listen to this, you should write, you know, I don't know. So man, um, you just said a lot of stuff, man. I, I mean, every time you open your mouth, man, you like, you like Jesus. Dad. <laughs> I, I swear to God. Man. Oh man. I'm going to, I'm going to have to watch this documentary on, um, on uh step and fetch it a little later, but I do got to bounce. Cause yes, I got yes. papers to grade and, and, a, and no doubt. And now you stuff. teach and where do you teach again, David? So I mean, uh, so I mean, I'm at Portland State University. I teach a, a writing class there and, and thinking about starting up some little side thing on the web. You go to my website, which is davidfwalker.com and and uh, and from there, you know, follow me, do whatever. I'm I'm working yeah. on being a better person. That's what my goal for today. Hey, you is are you're a great person, David. I appreciate you always coming on and supporting. Uh, we're definitely gonna have to have you back and next time we'll talk about um black exploitation because you are a master of black exploitation <laughs> films uh for sure and and other things of course but thank you so much for coming on man i know you gotta go so All peace right. peace yeah and uh long and prosper no hey, doubt hey. Live long and prosper. may the force be with you <laughs> no doubt um and dr lawana richmond you had something you want to say so i want to make sure you get to to say uh well, I mean, as far as my my night in Miami and uh, go ahead. So I mean, in terms of the film, it was entertainment. Um, I think it's important for us to have those stories, and I think um, David was on the mark when he said people need to be introduced to characters, and hopefully their curiosity will be aroused, and they'll go find out what the facts are. Um, at the same time, I think that we just need to, you know, we've got this when it comes to our entertainment. We've got this bar and this standard where we expect perfection when mm -hmm. sometimes we need to just, you know, make it where it's not a phenomenon that there's a black film. This year, I, I, in the last year, I watched um, One Night in Miami. I watched the photograph with my daughter before the pandemic, which I thought was it, it was a film that um, I enjoyed just because of the way it was made and um, the another one that just came out recently, Sylvie's Love. Um, another one that I just enjoyed. It was a um, it was just it was a period piece that was just it was enjoyable. And I think sometimes it's important for us to look back at history, even when it's a fictionalized account, and remember how things were. Um, like in One Night in Miami, that one scene when he offered to help move the furniture. Mm -hmm. Um, that's how it was. It was that matter of fact. It wasn't, you know, um, an attempt to be spiteful or anything to be ashamed of. Um, white supremacy was so um, blatant and just so pervasive at that time that they were very open about it. And now we're at a period that where we've come full circle, where like we just had this Trump presidency that allowed people to feel like it was okay to be open about it again. And I would say even the insur insurrection, a big part of it is, you know, they have all outed themselves in their communities, in their societies, it, because they were proud to finally be able to spout their, their rhetoric. And now with the end of that Trump presidency, it's not okay anymore. And so I think it's important to always look at where things were, because one of the things that history does is it repeats itself. And the difference is, you know, okay, we've seen this before, this has happened before, I recognize it, what can I do different in terms of how I respond to it. And some of that learning is through um, immersion in entertainment. I mean, I look at like the, the Game of Thrones. Um, that was the most like backstabbing is like don't trust anybody everybody is it's like it was like a soap opera but 
in a lot of ways, I would equate that to reading Yorubu by Marimba Ani, which is an African-centered um, critique of European culture. But Yorubu is a lot harder to read than Game of Thrones is to watch. Right, right. That's that's exact. That's exactly my point. Though. That's why I love what Dave said earlier. You know, it's it's about the delivery a lot of times. You know what I mean? If you're gonna really get the the point across. You know how you how how are you delivering this? You know what I mean. And uh, we need to work on that. You know, what I mean? we need to really work on that. You know. That's no, no, I think I think we definitely need to make sure that we polish. But what I will say is for what uh, Luana just mentioned, it's okay for it not to be a great film. Oh yes. Standards always so high because let, let's look at it like this: How many people watch My Girl or Ferris Bueller's Day Off or you know these movies that you're like, eh? It, it was okay. I didn't have nothing to do, so I watched it. Why can't black movies be like that? You know what I'm saying? Why can't you like Sylvie's Love? Like everyone's waiting for the shoe to drop, but it was a great film. It, it it didn't have no backstabbing, no underhanded black male, no underhanded black woman. It just showed black love being black love, right? So why can't you just have a simple story? Because we are like they say they come to us for the the drama drama the the the, the, the reality show exactly they, come for, Not, they don't come with us for the, the real art they just come right for, but we the, gotta put ourselves in the position where we say no you're not gonna utilize you're not gonna we're not gonna be your sacrifice yeah, exactly. like, like we're not gonna be your sacrifice when you come to try and lynch us and destroy our towns and we're not gonna be our sacrifice in the media when you try and show us being killed first in the first 15 minutes you know what i'm saying right. or by the end of the film no we're gonna tell our stories in the ways that enlighten us and we, we and show all, us in a positive we, way we're not just gonna be thugs and thoughts every time you get a million dollar exactly. pl platinum right. hit. You know, you get a platinum hit because you a thug or a thought. You know, I mean? you don't get no platinum hit for nothing else. You get a platinum hit for that. You know what I mean? That's the only exactly. thing you get a platinum hit for. You know, same thing. It, Bill Cosby, cinema, right? Look what they did to Dr. Cosby, right? You know what I mean? Ar arguably, I want to just talk about his body of work. Who cares about well. Those accusations are horrible, if true, right? But in 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 my opinion, his body of work, you know what I mean? It, I, and then you got the the uh, other TV dad. What was the guy from the show uh, Seventh Heaven? He's, yeah, yeah. He's a nut. He's walking around the street. You know what I mean? They said the other dad from you know. You think they? You think white America would allow them to take? Uh, uh, imagine there was an accusation again. What was the guy? Uh, let's do, do a, or leave it to Beaver's father. Oh, no, Little House on the Perry. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. I think they could have an accusation against white people would be up in arms. Yeah, yeah. I think the fact that they take the show off the air and you can't find it in in syndication or anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely that's definitely that's an, there's that, an that's argument. It, that's it. We get into that line what I was talking about before, where. Black people don't take care of black people, but right. every other race, every other race, I don't give a damn what it Chinese, Asian, Mexican, uh, whatever you white, whatever they go eat, even they bottom line citizen, they bottom line citizen, they gonna take care of that motherfucker because he's white. You know what I mean? That's the yeah. Way. They're gonna they're gonna give them the we opportunity. Don't we don't have that. We gonna right. go to the white man and say, oh, you know what? This black motherfucker fucking up. I with your boss. I wish you, but I'm not nice like Boss Man. I kill your ass. You know what I mean? You remember that? You remember that? That was one of my favorite lines in life and shit. I'm not like I'm not nice like Boss Man. I kill your ass. You know. Yeah, remember that movie was? What was that movie with uh with Samuel Jackson played that role? What was that the role? Django. The oh, Django. 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 Oh yeah. That's their gatekeeper. They got they got one like that everywhere. Every that's no excuse. This should not exist. That's yeah. like dude on the boondocks. Yes, yes, Uncle, 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 Ruckus. Uncle Ruckus. Yo, so I will say, yes, every culture has where they allow their people a redemptive quality, a redemption path for their people, right? Like when you watch the election, they said, there's still one path for Donald Trump, right? There's still two paths for Donald Trump. They always allow a, for a path to victory for their people. <laughs> However, 
<laughs> are we allowing that path for victory for our people? No, we not. We're throwing our people away. Exactly. Yes, and we can't do that. We cannot do that. That's like the um, you know, and that's a whole nother conversation. But we have this um, prison industrial complex that is chewing up our 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 community, and then when people manage to escape from it we then discard them and label them and stigmatize them right along with them right yeah you right agree definitely definitely and, and th these are the things that we need to work to change and uh one of the reasons i thank you dr lawana richmond for your dream tank taking place february 14th at the university of california at san diego and um, you also are involved with the Afrofuturism Lounge with San Diego Comic Con. Do you want to talk about that? Are you guys, are you, I know with COVID and everything is crazy. So uh, are you guys preparing for to do, to do something virtual or anything with that this year? So, um, so I'm, I'm a co-founder and organizer. The first year, um, I had a lot of help. The second year, I had a lot less help. The third year, um, this last year, I basically did it by myself. Right. And Which, I mean, and then this last year must have been really, really tough with COVID going on. Well, the thing is, for this, this last year, for 2020, it was really just a series of panels and discussions on Zoom. Right. And so now, for July, it, it'll either be hybrid or virtual, but I'm looking at different platforms in order to make it more interactive. Um, the biggest thing is to try and sustain it through the pandemic so that when we can all get together again, it's still um, thriving. Which, which goes to another topic we'll save for another show is um, the COVID vaccine. Oh. <laughs> and our communities, the indigenous communities reaction to getting the COVID vaccine or not getting the COVID vaccine. But we will definitely, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a topic for another show because that in itself, you know, it go, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, we have a major distrust of the medical profession. Look up the book, Medical Apartheid, um, you know, the Tuskegee experiment. But I will say that there have been a lot of, um, Black people involved in the development of this vaccine. And, um, you know, you need to do everything possible to uh, ensure your safety and the safety of your family. So uh, understanding that there are risks, there's risk, there's risk with us living every day. Um, so make sure you do the best that you can to take care of yourself and your family. And uh, yeah, yeah, any, I, I just want to say as we wrap up, any final words, uh, Dr. Luana Richmond, and I appreciate you being here. Well, I, I appreciate you having me. And I, I want to say just, you know, on the vaccine, the thing that makes me inclined to encourage people to take it is that um, the Black clinicians I know who are taking it, um, who have been involved with the development, who have um, taken it publicly and shared their experience, any side effects. And so far, the biggest thing that I've heard, aside from those really rare, like the Bell's palsy, is just your arm hurt. And you know, is is it worth having a sore arm to have a safer society? I would say yes. Um, I I'm just so glad that you brought the show back and just to reconnect with you, Sheldon, because the conversations like this are really important. And, oh, um, thank. You. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, and I hope that you will um, continue to have, uh, you know, continue to make sure to include the female voice as you go forward. Of course, of course. I, I, I'm hoping you'll be a regular. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yo, but no, no, seriously, in all seriousness, uh, Dr. Luana, yeah, I hope you'll be a regular. I hope you'll come back. Um, and if you, and we'll talk uh, after the show, if you can get any of those Black clinicians to come on and talk about their experience with it. I personally have taken the first uh, dose of the vaccine. And I'll tell you like, yeah, the only like the first night I felt like I had aches and everything and my arm hurt. But um, then after that, I'm, I was like, me and the other dude that took it was like, yo, what the fuck was in that shot? Because I felt like Superman, like, for two weeks after that, I felt like my <laughs> mind was clear. I was like, I was like working out. And I don't know, and obviously it could have been psychosomatic, like whereas like I'm not stressing that I'm gonna catch it, COVID and stuff. Hey, so you like just, you just I felt more shit. you know what I mean? Like what if, yeah, what, no. if that, what if that shit was an actual upgrade? 
<laughs> you just have to get over the signal. It's just, just the, no, the no. But they, but they put out a warning. They, but they, they sat us down and said, "Listen, don't get too overconfident because you ain't got your second shot. You could still catch COVID. So make sure you're still wearing your mask and be washing your hand, and doing everything necessary." But I mean, I will tell you, like I think the lack of stress from worrying about COVID in my environment definitely like cleared my mind a little bit and I, I had more energy, yo, you know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, if you could get any of those black clinicians on to talk about it, we will dedicate a whole show to it. So again, thank you so much uh, for being with us. And you ain't gotta go right now, we're just kicking it, we're wrapping up, you know what I'm saying? Um, and this is gonna be edited and this is a pretty much how we're gonna do the format of the show from now on. We'll get on and we'll talk like this, Mugnito will edit it and then uh, you'll get the final product. So Sheldon, I, I moved this week, and, and I stopped with my unpacking and sorting to come hang out with you. So I have a lot oh, okay. Of me. Um, <laughs> hey, Lawana, that was nice, man. I, I really appreciate you, man. You, I, yes, yes. Yeah, you opened up a few more chambers in my head. I, I love that. <laughs> I'll see you all soon and take care. All right, definitely. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us on Afronauts this week. We'll be back uh, shortly with our new program. Uh, big shout out to uh, David F. Walker with his new graphic novel, Black Panther Party. Um, also pick up Frederick Douglass and check him out in comic book stores all around. And thank you to Dr. Lawanda. And thank you to Dr. Lawana Richmond um, and her dream tank coming up in on Valentine's Day, February 14th. Uh, look on drlawanarichmond.com for more information and also on Astronauts' uh, at Facebook page, Instagram page, and our website, edfoodfoundation.com. I want to thank our sponsors, Ed Food Foundation for sponsoring this show and allowing us to be here. Word. I want to thank my peoples who helped make this show successful. Mugnito. Say something to the people, Mugnito. I love you. I love you. <laughs> yes, yes. And Pete, say something to the people as we go out. Bruh. It's Paco. Paco. <laughs> Have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs>